Hello guys and welcome back to this video series on restoring a traditional sawmill and today we're going to be looking at how we're going to power that and um, the sawmill was traditionally powered by a stationary engine like this one here and it was originally run by a Petter diesel, um, a five horsepower one actually, uh, which the guy I bought the sawmill off still had that, but it was so big and old fashioned, it wasn't really gonna be usable. Luckily for me, um, my neighbor actually had a spare Honda engine. And this one used to be from some kind of garden equipment. And he has a lot of trades people coming in and out and they left this one there. And it's got a few problems with it actually to get it running. It's been sat for possibly a couple of decades in his shed. He runs his one off a 11 horsepower and this one is a eight horsepower. So in order to get this going, there's a few initial things that I'm gonna to have to do before I can get it started. One of them is the pull cord is hanging out. The engine actually has really good compression. It feels as if it does anyway, and it does pull over. Um, but you can only get a few uh, rotations on the engine because of this hanging out. So that's going to have to be addressed. Secondly, this used to be obviously attached to some kind of equipment where it had a throttle lever on the end of it that you could control from handlebars. That's been cut off. And this here is the throttle mechanism here, which you can control manually by hand as well. Um, that's actually got a spring, you can see there, which is designed to pull the throttle back in place. Um, so I'm gonna have to remove that because we no longer need that anymore because I'm gonna be controlling this by hand. So that needs a good little oil and grease and then possibly tightening this to the correct tension. And then I can also now remove this throttle lever uh, cable as well, um, which is attached down in here. And coming around this side, there is signs it's had a bit of an oil leak at some point, um, but I checked yesterday and it has got what looks like new oil in, which is right to the top, which is good. Um, but here, they've also cut the on-off switch, uh, which would enable the ignition uh, to be working. So um, that again would have been on a handlebar originally with a little red switch. But there is a grommet here where I should be able to fit a kind of fixed one in position here that I can just switch on and off like that. And then coming around this side of the engine, this is our output shaft that we will attach a pulley to. And that looks okay. It did have a old pulley on, uh, which my neighbor removed already. So that's good. And yeah, in terms of this side, it's just having a good clean up really. And it's also got some old stale fuel in it. Um, I'm surprised it's still in there actually, but I don't know if you can see down there, but that's obviously been in a long, long time. So that's gonna to have to be emptied. And this part here, if you're not that familiar with how engines work, is the carburetor. And this is responsible for mixing the fuel and air before it goes into the engine. And this is often um, the main problem or the main culprit for two stroke and four stroke small engines not running correctly in my experience. So I'm probably gonna to have to take that off and give it a really good clean out with some carburetor spray um, before we attempt to start this as well. And the last problem I can see, which we're gonna to have to sort on this, is one of the four mountain holes here, um, which holds this engine down to whatever bracket or bit of timber I use, is actually cracked off, unfortunately, um, which may be why this engine was retired from service as a higher engine. The first thing I'm gonna do though is give this a really good clean and degrease before I start taking any components off and cleaning them. And to do that, I'm literally just gonna use some normal petrol that you'd have in your car, because it's really good at getting in and removing all that stuck on grease and oil. And 
another tool I find really useful for this is the old toothbrush once you finish with it. Always worth keeping them. And I want to pay special attention to get the worst of the oil and grease off here because these, this is the cylinder and this is an air-cooled machine so it uses these uh, to give a bigger surface area these kind of vent-like um, kind of shape to the assembly itself and it's not going to be able to cool itself to the fullest potential if this is covered in oil and grease. So here's the back of our pull cord assembly of the machine now and there's two possible reasons that could be stopping our pull cord going right the way back in and that is the spring that's coiled up in here at the back may be a bit corroded um, which I can get to, I don't want to be taking this apart because it can fly out everywhere but I can spray some WD-40 right in the back there and then hopefully get some oil into that. The second thing is you can see here there's this little indentation Apologies if the video is getting a bit grainy, it's quite late in the evening now. But the next thing I'm going to do is check the ignition. And by doing that, I'm going to remove the spark plug and the spark plug boot and then hold the spark plug near a metal component and try pulling the pull cord. And we should hopefully see some nice strong sparks because they're quite simple, these engines, um, in order to just at least see if they're going to run okay because we just need spark inside the cylinder and air and fuel mixture pumped in from our carburetor. And we need compression as well, which I'm pretty sure this has already got good compression. We saw earlier that the on-off cable has been cut off this machine. And in my experience from uh, doing some work on two-stroke machines in the past, when the on and off switch is disengaged or just disconnected completely, it often just allows the engine to run. So it shouldn't be a problem for getting the engine started with that cut off and we'll see if that's true whether we get a spark in a minute. So to get to the spark plug I need to remove this which is the spark plug boot cover and then that is our spark plug just down in there. So I've got this socket already um, on here which is a is designed uh, actually for spark plugs I think. It's an M14 That's coming out actually nicely. It wasn't too tight in there at all actually, which is good. Often people really over tighten these. And sometimes they're almost like seized in there as well if they haven't been used for a while. So that's a good result. This is a good example of why I wanted to clean the worst of the rubbish out of here first. Because when you're exposing openings into the engine and the cylinder, you don't want a load of dust jumping down in there. So to check if our ignition is engaged and we're going to get a spark. I'm going to put that back in the boot and hold it near a metal component and pull our pull starter cord. Oh, you see that? Okay, we've got a nice spark there. Ideally, I'd like to see if we can get this running without buying any parts first because I don't want to be spending money on it if there's any obvious, you know, major malfunctions with it. And I wouldn't be so confident if it was like a cheap uh, Chinese unbranded engine, but being this is a Honda, they are so well made that I'm quite confident that just by cleaning and servicing a few parts, we should be able to see at least if the engine is going to be able to run okay. <laughs> I'm 
just going to do that up. Not excessively tight, but just enough. Brilliant. Boot cover back on. Sorted. Hello everyone, next day now. Bright but frosty morning. So perfect for doing this, we've got good light. And we're gonna carry on where we left off yesterday, getting stuck in straight into the carburetor. So the first thing I'm gonna do is drain the float bowl of the carburetor here, where there's probably gonna be some nasty old stale fuel in there, and probably a bit of corrosion as well. And that's gonna allow us to drain that before we take it off. See a bit coming out already there. Right, while that's draining, I'm just going to remove our air filter cover here. We'll have a look what condition this air filter's in. Wow. So we've got plenty of spider webs in there. That's held on by another little wing nut there. Sure there. Okay, that's looking pretty rough, isn't it? Looks like we've had a mouse or something in there, having a good old chomp at the foam. And these have all been 10 millimeters so far. a little bit of penetrating oil on there as we go because it's quite a little bit corroded actually and then sometimes you can wind it back down a bit to lubricate the threads and then kind of work it out forward and back like that so we should be able to wiggle some of this off now hopefully Right, there's a few more things still attached here. We've got the fuel line coming in here, and I think this is called the, like a governor arm, um, which allows when the engine's under load, if it needs a bit more power, I think it can just, it just allows it to kind of adjust itself. Um, so we've got a spring and a little metal rod here to remove. See if we can release the carb a bit though, which might make removing those a little bit easier. Okay, it's coming. Go. I've got to remember which way all these gaskets go as well. Right. So what I'm going to do initially is just take this opportunity to clean up and get the, the worst of all this crud off the top here before we start taking anything else apart so we're not dropping any rubbish in there as we go. I'm going to cover the entry and the exit holes here as much as possible while I'm doing this. And this here is carburetor cleaning spray. Really good for getting in and just kind of blasting out the worst of the sediment. I'm gonna gently go over the surfaces of where our gasket lays to just remove um, some of these old bis bits of gasket here. Um, we wanna do this now rather than afterwards because I don't wanna risk dropping anything back in here after we've cleaned it all. Okay, so the carb is now pretty clean. We've got the surfaces where our gasket's gonna sit pretty clean there, and as well as most of the rubbish out of the top here. So the next stage, I'm gonna actually open our float bowl here, and also there's this kind of like sediment catching chamber here, initially before the fuel goes into that. So I'm gonna take both of those off now and see what lurks beneath.
surprisingly clean in there actually. And this is a point where I want to be careful again not to damage the little seal or o-ring that will be in there somewhere. Okay that's good, yeah it's round there, it hasn't pulled out or anything. Often these really expand when they come out and they're hard to get back in. And again there is some sediment in there but it's not too bad, I've seen a lot worse actually. So in here there's two key areas that I want to make sure are clean. First of all here we have this little float switch here and it's kind of similar to like you have in a toilet. So um, that can open and close when this is filled with fuel you can close off and then open up again. So in order to remove that I need to remove this pin first. I might just need a pair of pliers to pull that through. Brilliant, okay that's that out. So this little pointed black tip here is our needle valve. I want to clean down there with some carb spray uh, just to make sure there's no sediment sitting in there um, that's going to stop this fully closing off when it's supposed to be closed. Good, and I can see that's not blocked because when I spray down here, this is where our fuel comes in from that fuel pipe. It goes in through here into this um, sediment catch here, which when that's fitted would catch any little bits. And then that then goes down and this float valve is the initial bit which lets our fuel into the carburetor. So if I spray down there, we should see some fuel come out here if it's not blocked or some carb spray. Yeah. Just there, brilliant. Needle valve, a little spray off and I'm gonna get that back together. Okay, so to demonstrate how that works, if I blow into the fuel pipe now, the fuel inlet, and move this up and down, you'll hear the air be able to pass through there and not pass through there and I, when I open and close this. Now our next area of concern is down in this tube here. You can see that brass looking um, insert there which is actually called the main jet and that's a big culprit for being blocked up for an engine that's been sitting around for a while that could be a cause for it not to start so uh, you have to be really careful with these uh, to get the right uh, flathead screwdriver size because you can really round them off in there um, and then you're a bit doomed if you do that so um, we're going to do that now see if I can find a correct size screwdriver first. Well, I've just ground that screwdriver down a bit so it fits inside the little slot. Right, so that is our main jet and you should be able to see light through there. So that is blocked, so this wouldn't have actually run if I'd tried to just start this off as it was. And this is where I've got a few really important tools which I've picked up over the years um, which would be really difficult to do this job otherwise because of the small size of the holes and one of those is a micro drill bit set and these go down to really really minute sizes actually and you get with those uh, little kind of screwdriver bit which grabs it um, and the other tool are these welding tip cleaners and again these go down to a very fine size and it's usually like the smallest one you normally need to clean out these little holes. Um, and it's important you don't go shoving something wider down because if you open those holes up um, you're going to be changing the fuel mixture in your engine and potentially making it run too rich. So for our main jet here I'm going to start off with the smallest one and see if I can get that through there. Yep, it's going through nicely. And then I'll just go up to the next size to see if we can gently get that one through as well. I don't want to force it or open the hole up as I said, this is only brass so yep, it's taking that one as well. And I'm not actually going to go any bigger than that. 
because I can feel the kind of abrasive surface of these little files on there so I can kind of like just really gently rub the sides there enough that I can give that a good spray through now with some carb cleaner you should just be able to see some light through there now there we go there's one more part in here I'm going to remove you might just still be able to see a kind of brassy coloured part in there and it also protrudes up in at the back here you might just be able to see that so I'm going to try and get in there now with a screwdriver and push that down I think it's just moved Yep, so I should be able to hopefully now knock that loose and we should have another brass piece fall out of here. Oh, there we go. So there's that out. You can see that's got another set of really minute holes on there as well. And this has actually got quite a bit of sediment on it. So it's really important that I clean all these out as well. So fuel can now pass through all those holes. They're nice and clear. Right, and I'm now just going to have a little poke around in a couple of these other holes here just to make sure they are all clear. Give them a little spray through as well in a minute. So the next part of the process is going to be removing our idle jet and this is our idle speed adjuster here so I'm going to remove that screw and then we should be able to pop this black cover and the jet out. And it can be handy to remember how many screw turns this was screwed in for. So uh, when you put it back together, it's going to be the same. Eight. So eight turns, I'll put that back in later. Okay, that's just come straight off. And then we should gently be able to pry this out of here now. This is our idle jet, and this is usually the thing responsible with these kind of uh, smaller four stroke engines that will cause, especially on lawnmowers you often see it, the revs are racing up and down when it's idling going ee, 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 ee. and that's normally because this, these holes here are blocked in my experience. So I'm going to do like we did with the main jet now and just give this a good little clear through. So we'll just gently work it till it goes through. Okay, the carb spray has just cleared that out. You can see we've got fuel coming through there now. Eight. So I was hoping to be able to just tip some of that sediment out of the fuel tank, but that hasn't worked, so I'm gonna to have to take it off and see if I can give it a flush around and get it to uh, come out. And one of the nice things about doing this yourself is the vast majority of the time, if you put this in somewhere to be repaired, they wouldn't go through the effort of really cleaning up all the components like this. So it's just nice to know everything's clean and tidy. Good access to our throttle here now, giving it a good little WD-40 spray. And there's two parts of this I want to remove now, as I mentioned earlier. One is this spring here, which is pulling our throttle back to the off position or back to the idle speed. Um, and the other one is this throttle cable here as well. Right, there we go. So we can get that out of the way now. Screw this plate back on. Okay, there's that off and that's still pulling back there because our governor spring here is um, pulling it so I'm going to adjust this wing nut to tighten this up a little bit. Okay so now I can set our throttle to whatever RPM we want it. Okay, this isn't going to be much use, but just to give it an initial test, we'll put that back on. It's got a kind of internal 
filter there as well. So um, I've checked there's no rubbish in there. Obviously, if this engine is gonna be any good, I will change this straight away. Right, we're getting there now, guys, with this. Um, last thing I'm gonna do is try and make a bit of a crude on and off switch um, by stripping these wires back. And then technically I'm thinking if I've got these two cables bare here, there's two inside this sheaf, by touching those together should disengage the ignition when it's running. So I don't really wanna be pulling the spark plug cap off again because just pulling it over yesterday holding it still gave me a bit of a electric shock. So uh, I'll strip this back. And of course, I'll replace all this if the engine's gonna be any good. Right, those two are now exposed now, so I should hopefully be able to just pinch those two together like that if it starts up to cut it out again. Okay, so with the wires not touching, we should see a spark here. Hopefully you can see that. If I join those two wires together so they're touching. Yep, there's no spark now. Good. Oh, and just a quick example of what compression is. Again, if you're one of our regular viewers and you're not particularly have much experience of engines, with the spark plug out now, because there's no seal, uh, that's, that's basically an opening in our cylinder where pressure is created when um, the piston is going up and down. With that removed, there shouldn't be hardly any resistance to me pulling this pull cord now, which there isn't. When I put that in, it will now be like, quite difficult would be like fud, fud, fud to pull. And that is the compression built up inside the engine. If it didn't have that, it would be a worry. Well guys, I think we're ready for the big moment. See if she's gonna fire into life in a minute. I'm expecting it to take a few pulls to fill up that float bowl and everything, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> I heard something then. The top of this um, this fuel tank is already hissing, so possibly this air vent might be a bit blocked in here. Let's see what happens. Ooh. We had a bit of life. I can see something that's wrong here. Um, at the back of where this governor arm is, there's a lever which should be able to move forward and back, which is seized as well. So I'm gonna to have to see if I can release that. But it did sound like it's gonna start, didn't it? Right, I've just released that off. So our throttle is now moving this time. Let's see what happens. Well guys, brilliant news. The engine is running really well. Um, as you've seen there, I was just having to control the throttle uh, manually at the moment. Uh, Cause there's something quite not right with one of the levers there, um, but that's a simple mechanical thing. Uh, so really happy.
So I've just brought the generator over to my dad, who's an electrician, so he's got all the right connections and stuff here, so we can modify this switch so it fits okay. So we'll do that now. Okay. Sure. So here's our on and off switch again now, um, connected up. Uh, we've got new connections here and we're just gonna wrap those in some electrical tape, just because this is gonna be left outdoors a lot of the time, just to make sure no moisture gets in there. Right, new switch fitted, so we are put that to the on position and see if it's gonna work. We now have an on-off switch. Now I'm going to set the valve clearances on this. You can see here there's sediment that's getting in here and that's because part of the lip of this gasket has broken off so I'm going to have to replace that bit of rubber. Then I'm going to remove our pull start cover again. Sometimes there's two marks here and here which allows you to set your engine to top dead centre on the compression stroke 
but this one doesn't seem to have that. There's two times the piston is at top dead centre. If I rotate the engine over by hand now, you'll see that piston come up there and it's going down again. And I keep rotating with my hand and there it is again. And the one we're looking for is the compression stroke and those little um, kind of rocker arms should be loose on the compression stroke. So if I wobble those there, both of those are still tight. If we put that round again till the piston comes up to the top, which is there. Okay, you can see that one's loose there. That one's not, but it should be a little bit loose. So we'll see how much adjustment these need. I had a little look at the technical information for this engine this morning and the intake valve clearance should be 0.15 millimeter and the exhaust 0.2. And the tool we're gonna to be using to set our valve clearances are these feeler gauges, metric feeler gauges, up to one millimeter these are. So I've got to find first of all our 0.2 for our exhaust. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm going to turn this adjuster now until we can just put our feeler gauge in and move it forward and back with a bit of resistance there. That's pretty good. Um, we'll see if we can do it up without that moving. Okay, that's nice. Now for our intake, we're looking for 0 0.15. Okay, so that's too tight. Wind that off a bit. So we're too loose there. I'm gonna turn that until it starts to just bite there. That's good. Lovely. I'll just stick a little bit of oil back on there as well. Next thing then, our spark plug gap should be between 0.7 and 0.8 millimeter. Should be able to just gently push that open, there you go. Well, if you've made it this far, I'd like to thank you for watching. And I've just checked the engine outside and it is running nicely. We've got 60 mile an hour winds today. Yesterday we had up to 100 mile an hour winds, so I couldn't really film out there. Um, but I look forward to seeing you on the next episode where we'll be sorting out the pulleys and the belts for this and hopefully getting the sawmill running for the first time. Peace and plants. <laughs>